Hello and welcome to our webinar being broadcast live from the Wellcome Trust Cancer Research UK Gurdon Institute at the University of Cambridge. I'm Claire O'Brien, Information and Communications Officer and your host for this event. We're starting with an introduction from our director, Professor Julie Arringer, who will explain what we've got lined up for you. Hello, my name is Julie Arringer. I'm the director of the Gurdon Institute and I want to warmly welcome you to our alumni event. We're very sorry we can't welcome you in person this year, but hope that this online event will give you a good idea of what we're about and communicate some of the exciting science that we're doing. The Gurdon Institute was founded in 1991 to bring together two areas of biological research, developmental biology and cancer. We study the biology of normal development, that is how eggs become organisms, and also how normal growth and maintenance go wrong in cancer and other diseases. Our research has led to major insights into understanding normal development and also the specific defects that, go, that give rise to cancer and other diseases. And these findings have been successfully translated to drug discovery for treatments through spin-out companies. Following my welcome, there will be a video tour of our institute so you can see what it looks like and see some of our scientists in action. And then there will be two talks from PhD students who will tell you a little bit about their research and they will be available to answer any questions that you may have live after their talks. I very much hope you're going to enjoy our online event and that we'll be able to welcome you in person another time. Welcome aboard our Institute tour. I'm Bruce Daniels and I'm going to give you a flavour of our exciting and important research, showing you where and how it all takes place. Our purpose-built building in the heart of Cambridge houses 16 research groups and along with core support staff, we have about 250 people on site. The researchers here publish around 80 papers per year in top scientific journals. It was John Gurdon who established the Institute almost 30 years ago to bring together researchers working on both developmental biology, how a single fertilized cell gives rise to a whole organism, and cancer biology, what happens when normal processes break down. Dr. Gurdon won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for proving that every cell in the body contains the same genetic material. John still works here in the lab every day. Our research groups all follow different but related fields so that we can describe our work in four topic areas. Let's head upstairs to the St Johnston lab where researchers use fruit flies, Drosophila, as a model organism that shares 70% of the genes that cause disease in humans. One of the techniques we specialise in at the Gurdon is microscopy, to see things happening on a minute scale, such as these cell linings of the stomach of the fruit fly called epithelial cells. Here is one of our confocal microscopes in which we illuminate a slice of the sample. The fluorescent colours can show cell nuclei, genes, or the structural scaffold inside the cell. We can track what goes wrong if we manipulate the genes in the flies to give us clues about what might be happening in human cancers and other diseases. Some of our researchers are actually building the next generation of microscopes for super resolution microscopy. Fruit flies are used in several labs here for investigating different aspects of health and disease. One of these is the study of mitochondria, the power plant of cells. The Mar Lab uses genetic manipulation and breeding experiments to track how mitochondrial genomes compete, providing insights into human mitochondrial diseases. The Brand Lab is another that uses fruit flies. This time to examine the stimulus for brain development. A different model organism is the nematode worm, just one millimetre long and easily grown in large numbers in petri dishes. 
The Arringer Lab researches how genes are turned on and off in the three-dimensional structure of chromosomes called chromatin packed into cell nuclei. The MISCA lab focuses on how RNA, the working copy of DNA, can affect gene expression and inherited characteristics. Frog eggs provide a model of a cell that is large and plentiful and is still used by the Gurdon lab and also by the Gallup lab. who are exploring cell membranes and their finger-like structures called phylopodia. Yet further model organisms, including yeast, are researched in the Zegerman lab. Whilst human cells in culture are researched in the Jackson lab. The Sarani lab works on the earliest stages of human development and the germline, requiring special culturing techniques. A new specialism at the Institute is the culture of organoids. Tiny clumps of self-renewing cells from specific organs, such as the lung, that provide a way to observe development in progress. The Rawlings Lab are investigating lung development and regeneration in the hope of finding clues to help premature babies and adults with chronic lung disease. Some types of research generate huge quantities of data that require storage and then semi-automated analysis, such as the results from DNA and RNA sequencing, which our bioinformatic experts will work on. The specialist imaging processes also turn out tens of terabytes of data. For all of this, we need dedicated high performance computing clusters to store and process the data. At the centre of the Institute is the all important media kitchen, where the team prepare all those petri dishes, fly vials, and food, and dozens of different types of chemical solutions used in lab experiments. Having this dedicated service means the scientists can concentrate on their research and can rely on consistent, reproducible reagents and growth media, a luxury for most departments. When researchers are not busy in the lab, our tea room buzzes with people in discussion over coffee and cakes or having team lunches, often spilling out into the garden in good weather. This also provides a space for large seminars and parties. The admin team support the scientists with day-to-day -day paperwork, submitting grant applications and sorting out visas for our researchers who join us from all over the world. Back in the basement, our building and services team keep everything running. From gases to waters, to chillers, to heaters, to washers and to autoclaves. Finally, the storeroom has all the supplies any lab could desire. I'd like to thank you for joining us on this tour. A tour that supports our public engagement program, an important element of our work. Our mission is to make our fundamental biological research accessible and responsive to the public for the mutual benefits of inspiration, knowledge exchange and trust. You've now had the opportunity to see from the inside all our research. And I hope you'll keep in touch, following us on social media and looking out for us at other public engagement events. Thank you again for taking this tour. I hope that given you an idea of the hive of activity that uh, normally goes on in this building around me, um, of course, you know, that was before the COVID pandemic. Uh, currently, the end of September 2020, we're occupied, we are, or, sorry, we're operating at about 
occupancy and the researchers are having to work in shifts and it really isn't the same. So uh, we'll move on to our first presentation from Anna Townley in the Arringer Lab. Uh, this will run for about 18 minutes and please type in your questions using the Q&A panel, uh, which Anna will then appear live to answer at the end. Hello, my name is Anna and I'm a PhD student in the Oranger Group at the Gurdon Institute. And today I'm going to tell you about how mutant worms can teach us about our own embryonic development. At the Gurdon Institute, one of our strengths is that we work with a variety of different model organisms in order to understand human development and disease. And in our group, we work with the nematode worm Senurabditis elegans. The elegans is found in rotting fruit where it feeds on bacteria and at the fully grown adult it's one millimetre in length from head to tail. Today I'm going to tell you a bit about how C. elegans became a model organism in biology and how it fueled some really important biological discoveries and then I'm going to tell you a bit about our research and how we use C. elegans in our group. C. elegans was pioneered as a model organism in 1965 by Sidney Branner, who was working at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, also known as the LMB, in Cambridge at the time. And his work, along with that of Robert Horvitz and John Sulston, led to them winning the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2002 for their understanding of the process of development in an animal. So what do we mean by development? In biology, development describes a process by which a fertilized egg or an embryo changes um, via cell division and movement of cells and expression of genes to form the, fully, um, the full adult organism of all of its different organs in the correct place. This is a really complex um, process and is tightly controlled by cells by expressing their genes in certain times and places. And by understanding this process in more simple model organisms, we can then go on to understand it in human beings. This is a lab book from the 1980s of Sir John Sulston, who was working on um, C. elegans embryonic development. Each day for a year and a half, he would sit at a microscope in a dark room for eight hours a day and follow the development of the embryo under a light microscope. Each day he would pick a specific cell within the embryo and follow where it moved in the embryo and which cells it divided to produce. You can see here his hand drawn diagrams and he uses different colours, green, black and red, to show the different layers front to back of the embryo so he can produce these semi 3D images of what happens over time. After this work, um, he was able to produce these diagrams which show the positions of different cells within the embryo as it develops from an early stage to a larval stage embryo. This Nobel Prize winning work led to what we know, what is known as a lineage map for C. elegans. And this shows um, from the beginning of the embryo, which cells are produced and divide to produce which cells and where they are found in the body. For example, this lineage map highlights the green cells, um, which form the pharyngeal muscle um, around the mouth of C. elegans. C. elegans is particularly interesting because it is what is known as eutelic, and this means that its cell lineage is invariant. So every time we can predict exactly which cell in the embryo will give rise to which cells in the future adult. And every single adult organism has exactly the same number of cells. The way by which biology is able to control this to make sure that it's perfect every time is amazing. So this work led to, in 1983, in C. elegans, the first complete animal cell lineage, and also the first complete wiring diagram of a nervous system. Furthermore, in 1998, C. elegans was the first animal to have its genome sequenced, and this was also carried out by Sir John Sulston. This is an interview um, of, by um, Boris Johnson when he was a journalist at The Telegraph in 1998, and he's talking to Sir John Sulston who then later went on to work on the Human Genome Project. In this article, John Sulston describes C. elegans as a microcosm of humanity because it has a gut, a nervous system, muscles and reproductive impulses just like human beings. And what's more, it shares 40% of its genes with humans. So although you may think that it's a very simple organism, much different from humans, 
we actually share a large amount of our genetic information. So why is C. elegans such a useful model organism in biological research? Well, compared to humans, which have 100 trillion um, cells, C. elegans has about 1,000 cells in the adult organism, which is much more simple to work with. It also develops very quickly. So each embryo can develop to adulthood in approximately three days. And over the course of two days, one adult organism can lay around 300 eggs. This means that a single researcher can make millions of worms over the course of a week um, to work with. Furthermore, C. elegans um, are mainly hermaphrodites. This means that they produce both egg and sperm within the same worm, so they're able to self-fertilise. And this makes it really easy for researchers to make genetic mutants. Furthermore, C. elegans is transparent, which is great for microscopists because we can see within a living organism the internal organism, the internal organs of the worm without carrying out any manipulation. And further, furthermore, from the um, wealth of different Nobel Prize winning work, a scientist such my, as myself, who is joining C. elegans research, has a wealth of um, understanding of the development and genetic information to build upon. So, by using this microcosm of humanity, we can understand the fundamental processes by which the C. elegans embryo develops, and this can lead to more complicated research in humans. Another um, Nobel Prize winning discovery, um, which was partly carried out in C. elegans, that I wanted to introduce you to was the introduction of fluorescent proteins of biological markers, because this has become a really useful tool in biology to understand the functions of genes. Um, the, uh, this was first carried out when um, researchers in Japan extracted the fluorescent molecule from jellyfish. Um, they then um, modified this molecule to produce a variety of different um, proteins, including what is known as green fluorescent protein, or GFP. Scientists were able to introduce this molecule into a variety of different research organisms. So you can see it here in C. elegans, as well as in Drosophila, the fruit fly, rabbits, rats, um, zebrafish, and also some human cell systems that we use in the laboratory. GFP is really exciting because we can get um, certain cells in the organism to produce it so that we can light up only certain parts of the body. For example, this is a cover from Science, which is a scientific journal from 1994. And you can see here um, C. elegans, which is expressing, producing this GFP molecule only in the neuron cells, which will light up under the microscope. We can also um, engineer cells that make um, GFP only in cells where a certain gene is expressed. And by looking where genes are expressed in the organism, we can understand the function of that gene. Here is an example of a worm that has been genetically modified to produce GFP. So you can see some worms here um, have GFP which is being produced only in the skin cells or the hypodermis around the edge of the worm. And each individual spot represents a single spot cell that is producing GFP. There are also some um, worms on this image which are producing GFP only in the pharynx muscles which are at the head of the worm. So in our group, we are interested in embryonic development and larval development in C. elegans. Um, this is an image of C. elegans moving across a plate in a light microscope. And you can see um, the internal organ organs, and this is the intestine here. Something that really uh, struck me when I was first working um, in the lab with C. elegans was that you can see the whole process of development from egg to embryo in a single organ along the length of the body of C. elegans. You can see here what is known as the gonad, which contains the uh, sexual reproductive cells of C. elegans. Here along the length of the body, you can see these large rectangular shaped cells, which are actually the unfertilized eggs. And these large circles are their nuclei. As they move along the length of the gonad within the worm body, they grow larger before they reach the spermatheca here, which is where the sperm are stored. These eggs are fertilised um, through the sperm. 
and here you can see embryos, two cell embryos and later stage embryos as the cells divide. And here um, is the vulva where their eggs are laid um, and they eventually will hatch into larvae on the agar plate. It's really exciting, um, especially when I was first working with C. elegans, to look under the microscope and to be able to see this whole process of development from egg to embryo within a live organism as it's moving. So what am I working on in my PhD project? I'm really interested in understanding how genes are regulated within a cell. And I'm looking at this process during development. So you can see here an image um, down an electron microscope of a nucleus. Electron microscopes can achieve much higher resolution um, compared to light microscopes. This was taken in the 1970s and um, their early work, in their early work, they realized that the DNA inside a nucleus forms these two different types. There is this light white colored DNA, which is very loose and accessible. And the genes within this DNA are uncoded by the cell and lead to production of proteins, which carry out the function of the gene. However, there's some parts of DNA which are found in these dark regions, and these dark regions are highly condensed and inaccessible, and so they're effectively turned off. And this means that the genes do not lead to the production of proteins. So why do cells need to silence some parts of their genome and turn on other parts of their genome? During development, this is important for two different reasons. Firstly, Every cell inside an organism has the same genome, but they do not carry out the same functions. So each cell needs to express a different set of genes. For example, a stomach cell might need to express the gene for stomach acid. However, it does not need to produce receptors for neurotransmitters that might be found in the brain. So by having this gene silencing, each cell can um, achieve its own specific function. Furthermore, um, during the evolution of organisms, viruses have inserted their DNA into our genome. And this has led to a battle. Um, and our cells have um, evolved the ability to turn off these viral DNA elements inside our genome to prevent them from causing damage. So these two processes um, are important for normal organism development. In order to understand how genes are silenced, I've been using another Nobel Prize winning technique, which was discovered in C. elegans, which is known as RNA interference. Um, and this is a tool that we use to turn off genes. RNA interference were discovered by Andrew Fyatt and Craig Mello when they injected a molecule known as RNA into worms. When they did this, they found that the worm behaved as though um, we had turned off the DNA that has the same sequence as this RNA molecule. They also found out that the same effect could be achieved by feeding worms with bacteria that produced a DNA, an RNA molecule. When the bacteria were eaten by the worms, the RNA was absorbed by the worm cells when this led to turning off of specific genes. This is a natural process that happens in biology, but it's also an amazing tool to use in a lab because we can turn off specific genes of interest and look at what happens to the worm by understanding what happens in the absence of this gene, so we can get more information about its function. Just like by understanding diseases in humans, we can understand how um, normal processes happen in a healthy individual. Um, before I joined the lab, um, our group created a library of 2000 different bacteria strains, which um, produce different RNA molecules, um, which correspond to the sequence of different genes inside the worm. By using this library, we are, we are able to turn off every single gene in the, in the um, C. elegans genome, one by one. So how do I use this technique in my work? Well, in order to understand how the genome is silenced, I've been using this technique of RNAi to turn off genes one by one and look at how they affect the growth and the development of worms. I look at two types of worms. I look at worms which are, have mutations in um, genes important in gene silencing. And I also look at the effect in healthy worms or wild type worms. If there's a stronger effect in my mutant worms, this suggests that this, um, these genes that we are turning off are important in gene silencing. 
So as well, um, to understand the effect of the gene knockdown, I look at the observable phenotypes. So this you can see involves a lot of microscopy. So day to day in the lab, um, I start off my experiments by creating plates. So these plates are um, agar plates, which have a lawn of bacteria upon which the worms feed. And on each individual well, I will um, seed a lawn um, containing a specific bacterium, which produces a specific RNA molecule and will knock down one specific gene in the worm. And each different well will lead to knockdown of a different gene within the worm. Um, so this means that we can screen um, up to 2000 um, genes in the process of just months. In order to put the worms on my plates, I use what is known as a biosorter or a worm sorter, um, which is much quicker than doing this manually. And it's able to count and measure the size of the worms that it deposits on these plates. It works by placing our worms um, in the sample here, in the sample pot in liquid. And the worms um, pass through these pipes where they are um, measured by lasers and um, their path is um, altered by air flowing through the system. And this allows it to deposit exactly three worms onto each um, well of my plate and also to control the size of the worms so that I have a controlled age of worm in my experiment. After this, um, I incubate the worms on their plates and allow them to produce offspring. Um, and then eventually I will observe um, the phenotype, which is the observable um, characteristics of the worm that I can see under a microscope. So as well as effects on the rate of growth and the fertility, I can also see effects on the morphology or the shape of the worm. And here are some examples of what I've seen during my experiments. So here you can see two wild type worms under the microscope. Sometimes defects in gene silencing lead to defects in growth of the worm. And you can see here what we call a dumpy phenotype, which means that the worm um, is very short and squat and it has difficulty moving along the plate. Opposite to this, you can also get very long and thin worms. Other defects in gene silencing can lead to um, problems with worm movement and you end up with curled worms or worms that are paralyzed and cannot move along the plate. Finally, the vulva is a really important part of the adult body that develops during a larval development of the worm. And defects in gene silencing can lead to defects in the vulva that can be seen under the microscope. So you can see here um, what we call um, protruding vulva, and you can see these protruding vulva on the edge of the body. You can also get a phenotype known as ruptured, which is a particularly grim end for the worm because um, its intestine explodes through the vulva, which is not developed properly. And you should be able to see the intestine here on the edge of the plate. By looking at these different phenotypes, I can find genes that have a severe effect in my mutant worms. And then I will go on to characterise what the function of these genes are to hopefully understand better the process of gene silencing. So I hope I've convinced you today that not only is C. elegans a really exciting model organism to work with, but also it's really powerful for us to understand human processes of development that by understanding the fundamentals in C. elegans this can lead to more um, therapeutic and um, drug research in human disease. So I'd like to thank my group, the Oranger Group, um, which is pictured here, and also the Gurdon Institute Media Facility, who make the plates which I use. I'd also like to thank our fund funders. So um, these include the Wellcome Trust, the MRC, and also the BBSRC. And thank you for listening. A uh, lovely talk from Anna. I'm going to ask Anna to share her uh, camera and I'll try to spotlight her. Um, and I'll read out some of the questions. I can take the spotlight off myself. So we've got six questions. We'll see what we can get through, Anna. Um, <laughs> is, Bor is this Boris Johnson the same person as the current Prime Minister? <laughs> I should probably have pointed that out. Yes, he is indeed the current Prime Minister, which made me laugh, which is why I shared it with you. <laughs> um, okay, another question. Is there any work being done at the Institute on epigenetics? i.e. the influence of environmental factors in turning on and off individual genes. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, epigenetics describes the way by 
which cells can regulate their gene expression without actually modifying the DNA. So there might be chemical modifications added to the DNA that affect whether it's expressed. Um, so my work actually falls under the theme of epigenetics. Um, I'm looking at how um, genes are silenced by de deposition of these marks on the DNA. Um, but I'm less looking at the environment effects. But I know that in the MISCA lab downstairs, um, they work with a variety of different organisms and they do look at environmental effects. For example, um, one of my friends who's another PhD student, she's working on uh, cichlid fish and she's looking at the effect of their diet on their DNA expression and epigenetics. Fantastic. Um, another question, how long does each experiment take? Okay. Um, so I think the thing that takes the most time is actually just growing the worms and getting enough of them to start off with because I use like uh, maybe 100,000 per week. Um, so it takes us about a week to get the worms grown and then I will transfer them using the biosorter, which takes about a day, um, incubate them for four to five days and then look at the phenotypes. So I guess a whole run of each experiment will take about uh, two weeks and in that time I can screen 300 different genes. Amazing. Um, and why did you decide to work on C. elegans? Okay, um, so I hadn't worked on C. elegans before I did my PhD. I worked on yeast in my undergraduate. Um, so I didn't really know, um, I mean at the start I was maybe thinking it'd be more exciting to work on cell systems, but since working in Julie's lab I've become a full convert to working with worms. Um, it's really cool because you're actually working in an organism that is alive. It's not just a system that represents what an organism is. And also there's so many different techniques that we can use and there's so much past knowledge that it's a lot easier to carry out a lot of our experiments. Brilliant. Um, here's an interesting one. Are these worms the smallest multicellular organism by number of cells? You know, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I think they're probably one of the smallest. There's quite a lot of nematode worms, but I would have to check. <laughs> um, could this research eventually be useful for treating or managing diseases in humans that have been caused by gene mutation? By gene mutation. Okay, so I describe my work more as fundamental research because we're trying to understand the basics that go on. Um, but this is relevant to development of every single organism. But there are quite a lot of links to cancer development because in cancer there can be mutations of genes that are involved in gene silencing. So we hope that further along the line um, this might have a therapeutic um, aspect. Okay, um, here's an interesting one. You fed the worm, um, the special bacteria, to switch off and on genes. Could this feeding apply to higher level creatures? <clears throat> well, I guess it's particularly useful in worms because they naturally eat bacteria, right? Whereas um, high level organisms do not naturally eat bacteria. And that's why this um, particular tool is so good in C. elegans. Um, I don't think it would be, because C. elegans is so small, it can be absorbed from the intestine and affect all of the cells in the body. Whereas in larger organisms, I don't think the RNA would be able to reach all of the cells within the organism. Okay, and I think we'll have to take one final one here. Um, do we have nematode worms in our bodies? Well, so nematode worms naturally grow on rotting fruit where they feed on the bacteria. So if you're eating something that's been out of the fridge too long, possibly. Um, but luckily they don't survive above 25 degrees. Um, otherwise I'll probably have a few more in my body, to be honest. <laughs> so that's fantastic, Anna. Um, given our time constraints, we're going to um, move on to the second presentation. So I'm going to share my screen um, again to give you that. Uh, this one is from Shu Yu Lu in the Rawlins lab and uh, will take about uh, 16 minutes. And then again, there'll be a question session with Shu Yu. Hello, everyone. I'm Shu Yu Liu from Dr. Emma Rawlins lab. Today, I'm going to share some results of my PhD project to show you a morphogenesis example for human fetal lung albumite in developmental biology research. I'd like to start my presentation with the question, why do we study developmental biology? My answer is that we have the pure curiosity how human develops from one single cell to eventually a very complex organism. But more importantly, as you may notice, from the official website of 
the Gurney Institute and also the tour video, we study development to better understand disease. Then you may ask, among all the organs, why do we care about the lungs? Because if the lungs are not functioning properly, it is almost always suffering and quite lethal. For example, statistics here shows that in the States, lung and bronchus cancer have been the biggest killers. And it says that more than 100,000 of American people died of lung and bronchus cancers in 2018. Meanwhile, lung diseases are prevalent in people at all ages. For premature babies, they don't have a fully developed lung, and therefore they have trouble to breathe properly. In one episode of this American drama, House, this poor mother was suffered from a disease called the Miro syndrome, and Dr. House and his team were trying everything to accelerate the lung growth of the baby. So the doctors wouldn't have to terminate the pregnancy because babies younger than 31 weeks old cannot extract oxygen from the air and cannot actively make use of the oxygen even with extra facilitation. And I also have to point out that according to WHO statistics, over 3 million people die each year from chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases and most strikingly, about 235 million people are suffering from asthma, which is very common among child. So it is quite clear lung diseases are relevant to everyone or every family. And therefore research in the lungs is always trending and essential. And speaking of research, in biology, model animals are essential. And in the lung field, mouse models have been used for decades and are still very popular and common. But there are concerns such as interspecies differences, animal welfare, etc. But in our lab, we are very lucky having the access to a human tissue bank. The idea is that under the law and strict regulations in the UK, the funded tissue bank collects discarded human tissues from the clinics and distributes the tissue to research groups that are authorized to use human tissues. Our lab is authorized to use human lung samples and human lung samples only for research. And I have to emphasize here that this is a tightly controlled process with very detailed protocols being followed. Well, for the embryonic lungs we've received, sometimes, to be honest, I found the sample quite deformed and damaged, which might tell us why the sample ended up for research instead of a good life. But, well, nevertheless, to give you an idea how big the human embryonic lungs are, you can make a simple comparison between the organ at early stage with a penny. But to make the best use of those precious samples, instead of just taking some photos, we derived epithelial cells from the most distal tip region, as you can see here, by microdissection and culture the cells. But why do we culture these cells in particular? Because they can be expanded in a dish, meaning we will obtain a considerable amount of experimental material like we have a stock. Meanwhile, more importantly, the tip epithelial cells are progenitor cells, which means they are the precursor for all the other lung epithelial cells that exist in adult human lungs. And therefore, culturing these cells allows us to study the developmental processes in a dish. So what we do in the lab is when we receive a sample from the tissue bank, we will culture the cell in gel domes, which allows the cell to have some 3D space interacting with each other. And over time with proper culture media, the cell grow into 3D structures in various morphologies. They can be quite regular as spheres or very irregular, and we call it budding organoid. 
Well, before I go into spherical organoids, budding organoids, let's take a step back here and ask, what is an organoid? Well, there really isn't a clear definition, but normally we can call a simplified organ culture or a complex cell architecture in a dish as organoids. Essentially, it mostly consists of cells that make up to critical biolog biological functions and processes. And in my case, I'm particularly interested in the budding organoids because the budding phenotype happened in a dish is considered as a very simplified version of branching morphogenesis, the process that the fetal lungs generate the tree-like structure, the respiratory structure. And if we have improved understanding in how this developmental process is regulated, we could use the knowledge in repairing or regenerating an adult lung. And here you see a comparison of the cell shape and cell arrangement between a cross section of a human fetal lung and an organoid that I cultured. Most of the cells are columnar in shape and sporadically you can see some rounded cell residing at the basal side, which we think are proliferating or dividing. And I think it is much more obvious and clear if I show this 3D reconstruction video of a budding organoid and is quite reminiscent to an extending distal lung branch. But the good thing of organoids is that I can perform experimental manipulations on the organoids. A big question of my project is to ask which are the growth factors that contribute to budding, which is essentially asking what are the factors promoting lung branching morphogenesis. And speaking of growth factors, they are naturally occurring proteins or hormones that are capable of stimulating cellular growth, proliferation, healing, and cellular differentiation. Well, well I know this probably doesn't make too much sense, but I think you may have noticed in booths, for example, EGF serum. This EGM is a protein and a growth factor that is crucial for skin development, or retinal essence. Retinal is a hormone and a growth factor that is critical for neurodevelopment. So for the actual experiment, I'm basically testing candidate growth factor, which we learn from mouse works that could promote mouse lung growth. For example, FGF10 is considered as the most important factor in, in mouse lung development. But my results show that FGF10, surprisingly, did not really have an effect on human organoids. It is FGF7 that gives rise to the budding appearance of the organoids. And as for EGF, it leads to organoid growth for sure, but they just become bigger instead of budding. And to better, better illustrate the 3D morphology, I reconstructed the organoid structure from 2D images into these 3D architectures. And like I said previously, there are spherical organoids and this irregular budding organoids. The morphological varieties of the organoids growing in different growth factor conditions really allow me to study the mechanism of organoid budding, or in a bigger context, branching morphogenesis. So if I use FGF7 or EGF as examples, both of them bind to their receptors that are anchored in the cell membrane. And after this binding event, the receptor is activated or chemically phosphorylated. Followed by this activation, there could be multiple sequential phosphorylation events and more proteins are activated. The active proteins can either just stay in the cytoplasm and carry their functions, or some can translocate into the nucleus and regulate gene expression. Eventually, the outcome 
of FGF7 or EGF binding to their receptor is the phenotype, the morphology of the organoids. So basically, we know the input, which are FGF7 and EGF, and we also know the output, spherical or binding organoid. But what happened in between? What are the communication processes, or in scientific terms, signaling pathway that are triggered by FGF7 or EGF? I guess one thing that I can't miss in signaling pathway study is phosphorylation activities or the activation of the communication. Usually people would collect the proteins and try to find the active fraction from the total. The whole process can be complicated and slow. So in my case, I want to try something more efficient. So I adopt a fluorescent reporter system. The reporter indicates protein activities by the location of the fluorescence. For example, when ERK protein or AKT protein is active, their reporter localizes in the cytoplasm, whereas if the protein is not active, the fluorescence is found in the nuclei. So combining the reporter system and live imaging on the organoids I saw that if I intentionally activate this ERK signaling, the fluorescence travels from the nuclei, as you can see at time zero, to cytosol, as you can see at after 20 minutes, and it becomes even more evident after 30 minutes in this case. And therefore, using this model, I will be able to monitor to actually watch the chemical reaction by looking at the images, looking at the locations of the fluorescence. In other words, I see what happened in the cells in the real time. And my current effort is to actually repeat live imaging experiment. And meanwhile, I'm asking more questions about what are the outcomes of the protein activation? What are the gene targets? How does the cell change its shape and arrangement? These questions are still quite fundamental, but they will be referred to the lung regeneration processes, and therefore they are connective to the question, how to repair the lungs? Well, I guess before I wrap everything up, I really want to share an example how the organoid culture system has helped scientists identifying the COVID-19 virus from the patients. These are the screenshots from a documentary interviewing this young lady, the cell biologist who successfully cultured the virus from patient samples and with my poor translation on the side. Well, basically, Juna, this young lady, was trying to isolate and identify the virus by inoculating the scrap sample from the Wuhan patients to human airway epithelial organoids and also to other immortalized cell lines that are commonly found and used in the lab. And she found that 96 hours later, cytopathic effects, CPE, were expanding but there was no CPE in the regular cells. The expansion was only in the organized cells. And I'm pretty much sure we don't really need a PhD degree to identify the drastic difference from time zero to five days later. And then they managed to observe the virus, to pinpoint the virus under the microscope. And then the scientists were then truly confident to conclude that this is a new coronavirus found in human. Well, now the pandemic is still ongoing. So stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. To summarize my presentation today, there are three take-home messages. First is that human fetal lung derived cells are grown into organoids that are able to be expanded and preserved. Second is that human fetal lung organoids are a powerful tool studying morphogenesis in developmental biology. 
I do realize that I probably have to overcome many obstacles looking at something in 3D, but it is definitely the way to go. And third is that our lab has already had very convincing results that have improved our understanding of human lung development. And we are working very hard in this difficult time. And lastly, I'd like to thank my lovely lab, especially my supervisor, Emma Rollins, and my thanks to Claire and Anna who accommodated me into this event, and also Pete who has been providing IT supports. My appreciation also goes to the talented people of the Berlin Imaging Facilities who have really helped me a lot with my project. And thank you all for your listening. There are several questions that come in. Mm -hmm. First one, here's a, here's a lovely meaty one. What are the ethical implications of a lung organoid culture? Well, to be honest, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this question, but I do feel very grateful that I'm allowed to use the human tissues in experiments. And if something well similar happens to me, I will definitely sign the agreement sheet, to be honest. Um, okay, are there significant differences between organoid development and in vivo lung development? So, for example, blood supply. Does this affect the results obtained from organoids? I see. Well, at the moment, our organoid culture are still very simple. So we have only one cell type, which is epithelial cells. We don't have blood cells or, for example, muscle cells that is naturally exist in human lungs, although they are very important and essential for a proper lung function. So although we are trying to actually increase the complexity of the organic culture in the lab, it is not something very simple because it's not a simple biological question. It will also ask helps from, for example, biomechanics and biophysicals. Okay. Um, Another one here. Do you think your research could eventually lead to a cure for COPD? And if so, how far away is that? Um, well, I think I have some confidence on cured COPD maybe decades ago. What I can say is what's happening right now is we, we have like results that will improve the treatment. That's all I can say. But for, for a complete cure, I think that will happen maybe years ago, I think, because COPD is a very tricky disease. It can vary from person to person. So it's not something that we can just give all the patients with one cure and that's it. it will be much complicated. Okay, now someone else is asking, does your work generate insight into how tobacco smoke damages lung tissue and performance and ultimately generates cancerous growth? Uh, like, like I said in my presentation, I tried to test ERK and AKT, these two signaling pathway. Uh, they are not just some pathway that are important for fetal development. They are also critical signaling pathway that is, seems to be mutated or seems to be promoted during cancer progression. So I think similar experimental settings or similar experimental techniques can be adaptable for, res uh, for researchers that are working on cancers. Okay. Um, how about this one? What is the highest number of cells that you've managed to grow within a lung organoid? Well, to be, not, to be honest, I try not to really grow my organoids into a, like a big balloon in, in the dish because that will actually slow down the proliferation and it might actually alter the uh, biological and the physiological status of the cells. But I think I can like easily reach to maybe millions of cells in one well of my dish. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Now I have um, a question here, what I'm not quite sure, but what is the difference here? It says between uh -huh. basal, FGF7, FGF10 and EGF. Oh, all right. So that's four different conditions that I'm testing in my experiment. The basal means some sort of baseline control, like people have to answer some daily questions in a polygraph before, before the real questions. So that's my basal control. 
and I'm testing FGF7, FGF10, and EGF. These three are three proteins, um, growth factors, pro, uh, growth factor proteins that I'm thinking maybe they are crucial for lung development, but I'm, I don't have a, like a clear idea. So I'm testing these three, adding to the basal median and comparing with the basal median. Okay, thank you. Um, I could quickly bring in Anna as well. Um, there's, re there's just one question I think I could put to both of you, Anna, if you want to put your um, camera on, if I can spotlight you as well. Uh, one of the earlier questions that came in was uh, what kind of qualifications or degrees uh, do you need before you can start doing the kind of work you're doing? So Anna first. Okay, so um, I'm a PhD student, so I have a um, I have a master's degree in biochemistry, but you can go to a PhD from a bachelor's degree in any science, I would say. Um, we have a range of different people working in our lab, so we have people with PhDs, we also have people doing master's projects. Um, we have a lot of undergraduate students who do summer projects, um, so they don't have a degree, just an interest. Um, I think enthusiasm is the most important thing to get work in a lab. And for uh, Shu, you, what about you? What was your background in terms of uh, topic subjects and so on? <laughs> well, my background is environmental science. I have a master's degree in environmental toxicology, but I do have my enthusiasm uh, in developmental biology because, again, I want to know what the normal processes happened in human before I know how environmental pollution affects human health. So I guess enthusiasm and some confidence will be essential. Fantastic. Okay, so we are drawing very close to the top of the hour now, so I'm, I need to draw the event to a close. Uh, I want to thank both our wonderful panelists here for lovely presentations. Um, a big uh, thank you to Peter Williamson, who's provided the IT support, and obviously to all of you in the audience uh, for joining us and for your challenging questions today. Um, please follow us on social media and um, on our website, and we do hope in the future we can invite you to the Institute in person. Uh, but at the moment, it's not possible. So uh, uh, that just brings me to say goodbye and keep safe. <laughs>